I am pleased to be here at this great conference to talk about medical domain area, an area that I'm working in, which is in imaging informatics focused across the board. I'm actually a radiologist uh, whose research has been focused in data science and not just radiology images, but also pathology, ophthalmology, microscopy, a variety of images, because the breadth of images that are confronted by clinicians in their practice is broad, and they're all complementary and informative. And as, our, as the previous speaker talked about, in medicine, there's tremendous opportunities of these artificial intelligence technologies, not just deep learning, but even classical AI methods that preceded that in image analysis to enhance uh, clinical care. And I'll be talking about a variety of projects our group's been involved in that span some of these techniques. I first want to acknowledge, though, the work of my team who uh, I'm doing all the, the work that I'll be talking about. Hopefully, I haven't omitted their names from slides as I'll be presenting various projects, as well as my uh, funding support. I have no uh, personal financial conflicts other than grant funding from these uh, different groups. The take-home points I'm going to focus on in this presentation, four take-home points, and I'll go through them as we go through the presentation, but just to give you a preview. I first want to motivate the need for AI methods and imaging by discussing variability, both in people and patients, and in clinicians, practitioners, who are taking care of patients. And that variability can be addressed by AI methods, just like AI methods are addressing uh, human performance in non-medical fields. One thing that's really important in medicine in particular, though, is a humongous amount of data that in the last few years has exploded at super exponential rates. And that makes medicine particularly unique in this regard, perhaps more than other areas. Medicine used to be mostly paper-based, and the images were film-based. And only the last few years has this all gone to electronic, and it's, it's exploding at a, a rapid rate. And there's clearly a, a need for uh, computers to enhance practitioners' ability to take in all this image data and make sense of it. In addition to that, imaging data doesn't live in a vacuum. Practitioners need to integrate the image data with all the other data available about a patient, and there need to be methods for doing that. I'll be touching on that. And finally, I will close by talking about specific applications then that will leverage this data for improving clinician decision making. So decision making is really the ultimate goal for AI with images that I'll be focusing on. So talking the, the first point, uh, variability in uh, people. So just look around you. We all, we, we, although we share the same genetic material, 90 plus percent, uh, we are very different physically. And the diseases that we have differ. I mean, some of us won't ever get disease. And those who do, we have a classification system. Pathologists look at tissue and they say, well, you have breast cancer. But that is not specific enough. We recognize there is variability in disease. Uh, and the disease variability can be seen at a molecular level. So this is a technology that I'm showing, microarray analysis from the early days. Uh, there are other molecular profiling techniques. What I'm showing you here in this slide are a group of patients. Each column here is a different patient. Uh, and the rows are the different genes that were measured by a gene array expression analysis. And the arrays were then clustered so that similar patients were brought together. And what this analysis showed was there were four discrete subtypes of a group of patients who had the same label, the same disease. They all have glioblastoma multiforme, which is a type of brain cancer. And yet, although they all have the same disease from the pathology point of view, at the molecular level, there are actually at least four different groups. And more importantly than just molecular diversity is there are clinical differences in these patients in terms of the drugs they respond to, in terms of their survival. And this is the basis of this new paradigm called precision medicine, recognizing we, people vary a lot, their diseases vary, and we want to recognize what are the actual specific subtypes of disease patients have so that we can tailor treatment. And they don't only vary at the molecular level, they also vary at the imaging level. These three patients have the same disease, glioblastoma multiforme, but these are MRIs, these are cross-sectional views of their head, and these three patients have lesions here that I'm pointing to, but they look very different uh, to, uh, from the image. So they vary, the phenotype varies as well as the molecular pattern. And very importantly, the clinical characteristics vary. So our goal is to understand this variability and identify the particular subgroup type of disease patients have so we can enable this new paradigm 
that is called precision medicine, where we want to target the treatment to the specific type of disease patients have. So in the future, we will have this paradigm that's called digital phenotyping, where a patient comes in and we say, well, we can figure out exactly what type of cancer, what type of pneumonia, what type of chronic condition you have, and identify what is the most specific treatment. This brings up a tremendous opportunity when we have a lot of electronic data for discovery. I mean, how are we going to develop that precision medicine paradigm? We're going to do it by mining tremendous amounts of electronic data and discover those subtypes and find out what treatments worked well or didn't work well in those patients. So this is a huge opportunity for big data in medicine and is the main paradigm that's driving this precision medicine uh, phenomenon. And from the imaging point of view, what it requires is discovering the phenotypes of disease in images to get computers to look at the images and find out what are the features of disease that are present in the image to, to enhance the ability of clinicians to do that uh, task. I call that digital phenotyping. Now, but beyond precision medicine, you know, that's patients who have disease. We can go further because Ideally, what we want to do is not just treat patients who already have disease, but figure out who's going to get disease and try and prevent it. And at the Stanford School of Medicine, our dean has this vision for identifying disease before it even takes place so that you can undertake targeted prevention or early detection of disease. And from an informatics point of view, the problem is almost the same as precision medicine. It's if we have enough data of people who were in a pre-disease state who then develop disease, can we find predictors in their molecular profile, in imaging features, if they had screening mammography, in their environment, in other factors that we can collect. And there are a number of large prospective studies ongoing, such as the Google Baseline study, that are targeted just to do that, or the UK Biobank Initiative in, and, uh, in England that's taking huge cohorts of patients and doing comprehensive characterizations of people in the pre-disease state and then following them longitudinally. And as we collect more and more data on healthy people with the wearable technologies, et cetera, and track outcomes, there's the opportunity of applying the same data mining methods to discover features of people before they have disease to develop predictors and monitor their health on an ongoing basis and intervene before disease happens or at the earlier stage where having an intervention will make a big difference in clinical outcome. So the second point I want to talk about is this enormous amount of data that we have. Now in imaging, it's really easy to see how much data we have. And this slide is even out of date. I've taken two panels. This is a, a list of patients. Each of these rows is a different patient. These are CT exams of the abdomen and pelvis. And in green is the number of images in 2001 that each of these patients who had a CT of the abdomen and pelvis had. And you can see on average, there were around 100, 200 images per patient for a CT abdomen and pelvis. And look what it is in 2009. Now, if you look at what it is in 2017, it's about five times as much as that now. And a lot of this has to do with advancing technology. The slice thickness is getting thinner. We're scanning more and more of the body and the number of images increase. So a radiologist still has to read the same number of patients on a daily basis, but now they have so many more images to read to get through their workday, and it's starting to feel like uh, Lucy with the, uh, the, the rapid turning uh, uh, pipeline of uh, candies to be wrapped. Uh, so that, that's a setup for error, and a, that cries out for computer help to help clinicians interpret an increasing number of uh, images. But even on the non-image side, there's an explosion in non-image data. This is a, a graph uh, that's showing the uptake since the adoption of the, uh, the health um, uh, initiatives to encourage practices to go electronic. There's more and more data, EMR data, electronic medical record data, that's now electronic. And that means there's huge opportunities for doing this. If you can get access to a lot of images and get access to a lot of medical record data, we have the ability now with this explosion in data to start building models to discover the best treatments for patients. And this label, this paradigm called learning healthcare systems has emerged to capture that concept of leveraging the electronic patient data that's now at our fingertips. Look historically at patients who've had treatments, who we know what their outcomes are by mining medical record data to discover, well, what are the best treatments for them? It's kind of a paradigm would be similar to, find, I, I'm a patient, I've got these characteristics, find other patients in the accumulated medical record who are like me. What, what treatments did those patients get and what were their outcomes and can we leverage that to figure out what the best treatment for me would be? 
And the, the concept of a learning healthcare system is taking all the electronic data in not only one institution, but many institutions by linking them up and defining a set of characteristics that to pull back a cohort of patients who are like a patient you want to make a decision about, examine what treatments they received and what their outcomes were, make a decision, and then that data is going to go back into the medical record. I mean, once you make a treatment decision, you treat the patient, that's new data that goes into the medical record. And those outcomes eventually are accessible for a future query. This patient who was untreated and had an outcome now, hopefully with better decision making, starts as we move through this cycle, uh, producing a virtuous cycle of improved decision making and informing the care of other uh, patients. Uh, so, in, in these, these cycles are defined in terms of afferent and efferent limbs. The afferent limb is one of iteratively collecting and querying the data from historical records. The efferent limb is I treat the patient and I generate new data that's going to go back into my database, the medical record, for query and informing decision making in future patients. So this is a great paradigm. Has it been implemented yet? Well, actually at Stanford, it is being implemented. There is uh, a number of predictive models that are now being uh, deployed in a, uh, a decision-making clinic called the Informatics Clinic, and there's some other institutions who are trying to implement this paradigm with clinical record data. Not yet with images, I'll be talking about images uh, next, because you need to integrate these different types of data. Uh, it's easy to get at electronic accessible lab data and molecular data, because that's in a structured form. That's already in a queryable form in a database. But image data, pathology image and radiology image I'm showing here, it's unstructured. I mean, the computer can see the pixels, but you know, what does that mean? Uh, a human being can look at the images and recognize, oh, well, this is an MRI of the knee and of the brain, and I'm seeing a mass, but computers don't know that yet. You need algorithms to recognize those things, and that's the focus of a lot of the research in AI and imaging. In addition to that, human beings, clinicians, look at these images and generate text reports. Well, that's good information, and that is electronically available in the medical record, but that's also unstructured, and so there's another whole field of work called natural language processing that's focused on pulling out or recognizing what are humans seeing in these images. And if algorithms operate only on the text and they don't look at the images, well, you're only seeing the information that a human saw. And to the extent there's other information in images that humans don't see, we need our algorithms to look at both the text and the images, which is the focus of my work, integrating that with this other information and then generating applications to help clinicians do this integration and make better decisions with that integrated information. So I want to finish with the last point of talking about well, some of the AI methods that we use to do that and some of the clinical applications that will leverage uh, that uh, integrated analysis. And the, the key decision scenarios that I'll go through for applying these methods, you, know, you would think, oh, it's all about diagnosis. That's number three. Uh, actually, there are multiple tasks that clinicians are engaged in in interpreting images that's critical for decision making. The first one is, is there disease at all? So that's, I call that disease detection. So screening mammography is a good example of that. A woman comes in every year when they're over the age of 50 to detect does the patient have an abnormality that could be a cancer. So that's the disease detection problem, or you think about it as the radiological equivalent of the airport screener. Lesion segmentation is I've identified an abnormality. I now want to circumscribe it on the image and characterize that to pull out features, identify uh, aspects of that lesion that will help me figure out what it is. So that's segmentation, outlining the lesion, which is a separate computer vision task. And the figuring out what it is, that's number three. That's diagnosis. And that's actually where most of the work in imaging AI is, is what is the disease. But actually, diagnosis is something clinicians largely do pretty well. I mean, if we weren't doing it well, patients would be dying left and right because the images weren't being interpreted well. There was, I'd say on average, you know, 15 to 20 percent of cases really need diagnostic help uh, for, for clinicians to do a better job. But number four, five, and six are areas where clinicians really need help. They don't do well on their own. Treatment selection, what is the best treatment? And that comes back to this concept of digital phenotyping. I've got a lesion, fine, I saw it, the computer saw it. That didn't need the computer to help me with that. I, I know what the diagnosis is, I know what's cancer, but what type of cancer is it? What treatments can be best for this patient? Can the computer see features in this lesion that tell me it's this type of cancer? Remember that molecular profile I showed you earlier with the glioblastoma multiforme? 
What subtype is it, and what is the best treatment for this cancer? This is something where clinicians definitely could use help, and there's great opportunity for AI methods. Response assessment, I start the patient on treatment. I'm gonna repeat the imaging over time to figure out how is the patient doing during the treatment, because if the patient isn't doing well, I'm gonna to need to make a decision about switching treatment, or maybe discontinue treatment. Maybe the patient, if they have a, a, a cancer that's not gonna respond, should consider switching to hospice care. So that's response assessment. And the final one is clinical prediction. And there's two kinds of prediction. One is prediction when you get disease, or I, what's the best uh, way, how should I decide making a change in treatment once I've committed to a course? So prediction is also something clinicians do not do well, and they sort of fly by the seat of their pants, make the best decision they can, but there's limited data to guide prediction. So I'll go through each of these, and I'll be talk, touching on some of the different imaging modalities, radiology, pathology, ophthalmology, uh, neurobiology, just as, as example areas. And I want to also talk about some of the key AI methods to accomplish this. It's not all done with deep learning. I mean, there's, as uh, Pat Langley actually talked about, AI has been around a long time, and so has image analysis. And in the early days, and still modern era, classic quantitative imaging is where you extract predefined features and a new paradigm in a large scale image analysis called radiomics, where you pull out features that human beings know are important, but get a quantitative uh, approach to having them pulled out. I'll also talk about how to get structured human observable features out of the image uh, instead of using an analysis of free text reports uh, with a method of a platform called EPAD. And I'll also, of course, talk about the obligatory deep learning, which is having a big impact in radiology, as it is in other fields. And then I'll also talk about leveraging multi-site uh, data. So radiomics is this paradigm of if you know what features are important in an image, you want to extract that in high volume. It's basically mine lots of images in large scale. Uh, it was, radiomics was named after genomics, where we mine large amounts of genomic data. And if I have a huge collection of images, I can mine a large collection of those, find features that characterize that patient population. What is the imaging phenotype that characterizes the GBM? And I sort of lay out a graph. You know, so imagine I've got quantitative feature one and quantitative feature two. In reality, these are big multidimensional vectors. But what this is showing graphically is that if I have a big population of patients, so here are patients who've got CT scans, and I pull out quantitative features that characterize them, and I plot that in some space, there tend to be groupings of these patients as characterized by their image features. And then you can develop supervised learning methods that will classify a patient to a particular group that you've discovered. So this graph that shows these different uh, groupings of patients according to the radiomics features actually is an example of what I call digital phenotyping. I've identified subgroups of patients who all have a lung mass, but there are different they, they differ in some way. They may differ in terms of, this may be a difference of survival. There might be a difference based on treatment response. But this is the paradigm of large scale quantitative image analysis to characterize subtypes of patients. And then supervised machine learning can be used to, to find what kind of patient, what kind of disease does this patient have? And you build a statistical model to do that. And the kinds of features that are pulled out are shape, edge sharpness, density, histogram characteristics, and texture, very important features. And there are a variety of mathematical formulations for doing this. I won't go into detail. With that, lots of literature on, on using these features. So we can handle a quantitative analysis just fine. What's actually handled less well is what does the human say about an image? I mean, humans, as I said, generally will dictate a text report. And we are working on a paradigm of using structured data capture mostly in the clinical research workflow, to capture in a structured way what do human beings see. So this is a freely available uh, open source tool, web-based, for viewing and annotating images and capturing the, the, the visual features that radiologists see. And then you can, uh, from that, also extract quantitative features. So we layer on top of that a pipeline uh, to process the quantitative features from the outlined lesion. And then we can generate uh, plots, summaries of, in this case, we're looking at populations of patients who respond or don't respond to uh, cancer treatment. Now, unsupervised feature learning methods, deep learning is just as important as radiology as all the other areas that was mentioned. Our previous speaker did a beautiful job talking about the network structure, I won't go through that. But instead of making a classification of, does the image contain a cat in radiology, it's What's the diagnosis? Does the image contain a mass or does the image contain a cancer? 
The process is very similar. You need a lot of training data. And that's actually one of the big challenges of deep learning and radiology is how do you train these networks if you've got a problem that doesn't have a lot of labeled data. And in radiology, we actually don't have much labeled data. Our labels are in unstructured text reports. So we're actually doing some work to try and address that problem. I mean, if we could take the radiology reports and extract what the uh, information is in a structured form, then we could have label, large collections of labeled radiology images for training deep learning algorithms. Uh, I mean, the, 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 the PACs, which is the, the, the image data repositories of hospitals, they, they contain tons of images and they contain text reports, but that's not the form you need the data in to do deep learning. So the goal is, can we extract our, the, the structured labels from the reports? And we're using some deep learning methods um, it, it, with a technique called word embeddings. Other people are working this as well, which permits you basically to analyze the co-occurrences of terms in narrative text and map them into a space, shown here on two dimensions, and identify clusters of terms that would uniquely describe different kinds of imaging features reported by radiologists. Here, these are different kinds of imaging observations that we discover from clustering word embedding uh, analysis of uh, text reports. And this is looking potentially promising for generating labels for radiology images. So beyond labeling images and beyond uh, getting access to electromagnetic data, we can do this in individual institutions, but no single institution has enough data really to do deep learning. You need to accumulate data from multiple sites. And the big question is, how can we do that uh, in a setting where people don't share data. I mean, there's lots of reasons hospitals don't share data. Uh, there's legal issues, there's privacy issues, intellectual property issues, and data sharing just does not happen in clinical medicine. I think the solution to this problem is to create models through distributed computation where uh, a site, you know, there'll be multiple sites, like co three collaborating sites who want to, don't want to share data, but they want to participate in a, a, a computation, a model fitting. Uh, if it were a model like logistic regression or Cox regression, you can actually factor or distribute the computation into individual computations run on local data and then aggregate the results centrally. Uh, and we're working on software that we're uh, working with Microsoft to deploy at multiple hospitals for fitting models that are amenable to distributed computation like this. A research problem is how could you do this with deep learning models? Uh, we have a recent paper that we just submitted to archive on different approaches for distributing the computation of deep learning models uh, for image training image classifiers. Uh, and uh, so these are four different uh, paradigms of, of training the, the model. And actually, it turns out in our paper, we found out that cyclical weight transfer, where you train the model on institution one data, and then you transfer the weights institution two, and then train on that, use that as your seed to train, and then transfer the weights, et cetera and you do that multiple times, you actually end up with a model that's very similar to the model that would generated by integrating all the data together. So I think these kinds of approaches may tackle the barrier of uh, sharing data. I want to end by just talking about uh, a few different scenarios where we're doing deep learning and other AI methods across these six clinical scenarios. The first one, for deep learning is really well fit for either image classification or segmentation. So the first task, uh, detecting and segmenting lesions. This is an example of a retinal uh, photograph. Uh, this is the outlines of lesions that were seen by a ophthalmologist, and these are the, the lesions that the deep learning algorithm detected, and there's pretty good correspondence. This is the same process in a micrograph of dendrites. So these little yellow dots are dendritic spines, and you can't see the green boxes, but there's good correspondence between detection of the spines by a deep learning algorithm, and uh, that corresponds with the human. Uh, this is uh, automatic segmentation, where we're using an adaptive method to segment uh, lesions that are the variety of lesions. And the, the, this is the, uh, an outline drawn by uh, a human. And our algorithm actually does a better job than the human. Here are a few more examples. Uh, let me just go to this example. This is diagnosis using deep learning in an endomicroscopic uh, device. Uh, a urologist is examining the bladder of a patient, and they put a device in, and they're scanning over the bladder uh, lesion, and they get a microscopic view that's high magnification like this, which is similar to a histology image. And the question is, is it cancer or not? 
and we generate a, uh, a real-time, this is a movie showing them scanning over a bladder, and then using deep learning, we classify each frame and display the probability of the different diagnoses as they're scanning, and so this is likely high-grade cancer that's being shown here, and here they're scanning a case that's normal, and all the frames are generally normal, or a few frames are saying maybe low-grade cancer. So I think real-time classification of movie frames and feedback to clinicians is a promising area for using uh, deep learning. But I don't think it's all about deep learning. For treatment selection, uh, this, the goal is digital phenotyping. Can you figure out what's the best treatment for a patient? Actually, if you've got limited data, like here is a case of GBMs. We had 200 patients, and we used classical image feature extraction from perfusion images of the brain. And we discovered there's actually two subtypes of patients who have very different imaging signatures, and those correlated with differences in treatment response. So using classical machine learning, we have a valuable potential application for targeted treatment selection. Uh, treatment response assessment, another uh, important problem. We're working on methods to automatically identify and track lesions across time to quantify how, how well they're responding to treatment. And the final one is clinical prediction. Uh, this is uh, using a quantitative analysis of pathology images to find, to find features and identify subgroups of patients who differ in terms of survival. So the pathologist sees a group of patients, they all have lung cancer, they have lung cancer, but quantitative analysis of the features shows there's actually two subtypes who differ in survival. And we've also used deep learning to analyze EMR data to, uh, to make predictions about who's going to uh, survive more or less than three months if they have metastatic cancer. So a variety of different applications. Uh, I want to stress that the main take-home points are the main reason we want quantitative image analysis is to address variability in practice and variability in disease to give information to clinicians to provide more precise diagnosis and hopefully identify disease earlier. There's an enormous amount of data that's an opportunity for developing these methods, and we need to integrate them. We can't get everything we want out of the images. We need to put that together with the imaging data, and the AI methods are powerful for doing that. And there's many important applications that will leverage analysis of large amounts of integrated data. And with that, I'll be happy to answer any questions if we have time. Thank you. Thank you.